Three years ago, during the height of quarantine, I caught a whiff of good old fashioned FOMO. Part of my FOMO stemmed from my misunderstanding about a specific genre that was wildly popular. There were a few series here and there that I remember and or watched, but the vast amount of titles left me scratching my head. With nothing else to do, I opened my crusty dusty laptop wiping my hand across the screen and sneezing uncontrollably. I searched for the genre on my anime list and anime planet, and bam, numerous upon numerous upon numerous of titles emerged. Slowly but surely, as I scoured the never-ending list, I stumbled across something. Ooh, oh yeah, that's the one. After consuming several episodes, I was hooked and wanted to watch some reviews. Huh, there's only a few. And that's what sparked this question in my mind. Why is this anime a forgotten piece of media? Short answer, it's a niche subgenre. Long answer, I plan to be its evangelist. How large does a series fan base need to have to garner more recognition and consideration? Does the relevance of historical anime transcend demographics to make it more palatable to broader audiences? Really, why can you hear a pin drop whenever this series is mentioned as a trendsetter in Isekai? Maybe this franchise's history is a bit more complicated than the 1400 characters my introduction can convey. Like, much more complicated. Let's dive in. It's June 20th, 1992. Kodansha released the first installment of Fuyumi Ono's historical adventure series, Juni Kokuki, aka The Twelve Kingdoms. The fantastical story is inspired by Chinese mythology, where a young girl is transported to an alternative universe and embroiled in various nations' politics. So you guessed it, Isekai. These events transpire due to the lead's mundane or unfulfilling lives. In the world of the Twelve Kingdoms, three high school students are sent to an ambiguous ancient China, where our main protagonist is thrust into queenship, therefore sending her friends into danger and painting them as fugitives. The Twelve Kingdoms would often get compared to Fushigi Yugi for its female lead trapped in Chinese mythology, destined for leadership and rivaling friendship dynamics, resulting in some isekai getting eviscerated online as redundant copycats. Despite historical fiction and mockumentary taking precedence, the stories were very different and basically is from far away that manga where a girl is sent to an alternative universe and speaks a different language from the mysterious man she meets. For those who are unaware, isekai when directly translated means different world or other world. Stories like these transport a character to a new and idiosyncratic space, to put it simply. Protagonists in isekai essentially serve as the audience proxy and reveal information by breaking the fourth wall. The cushy wish fulfillment coupled with social commentary is what makes this genre so enticing. This is why many anime fans have seen good isekai during this time period, and partly still today. When Ono's reprint of her 2019 Twelve Kingdoms novel was published, 500,000 copies were released and that number continued to climb. Needless to say, it was incredibly popular. But we're not there yet. We are here. On April 9th, 2002, the animation production company Studio Paris has acquired the rights to adapt the novels into an anime, with NHK entering the deal with them. And this begins our fateful tale. The Twelve Kingdoms rollout was an arduous endeavor. Volume 1, The Sea of the Shadow, came out in 1992, the anime adaptation was completed in 2003, and Tokyo Pop, along with fan translations, released English licenses of the novel several years later. The anime counterparts marked a wave of isekai series adapted for our TV screens. Besides The Twelve Kingdoms, we would get adaptations of Inuyasha, 
Harka Beyond the Streams of Time, Mar, Escaflone, Magic Knight Rayard, Kirakara Maho, and many, many more. Out of all the aforementioned titles, the Twelve Kingdoms seemed to be the most competent, which propelled the rise of a horror and mystery writer that came into clutch for many mangakas. While it might seem that Fuyumi Ono is a lesser known entity in the manga scene prior to the Twelve Kingdoms, she's been dedicated to her craft as a novelist for a very long time. She attended Otani University, where she got her undergraduate degree in Buddhist studies, and was a part of the Mystery Story Club. After graduating, she went on to pursue her master's. Unfortunately, due to financial instability, she had to drop out of the program. Ono recounts during this time that she was without a goal and felt completely lost. But to her surprise, she drummed up some buzz and it's how she got on the radar of an editor who read some of her novels written in college. The editor suggested she try writing for a living, which allowed Ono to get her feet wet in the Japanese literary industry. Ono made her published debut in 1988 with their story Sleepless on Birthday Eve, which was published by Kodansha featuring their ex-Bunko Teen Heart series. Following those series, she caught her big break writing the Evil Spirit series and The Demonic Child, which influenced parts of the Twelve Kingdoms. The Demonic Child, in particular, was a stepping stone in developing the Twelve Kingdoms lore, featuring a young boy named Kaname being spirited away to a different world and returned without any memories of what occurred. The story is told through the student teacher's perspective, Hirose, when connecting with the student Kaname. Hirose begins to notice strange events with Kaname as they spend more time together. These strange events take the form of monsters Kaname can't control. Ultimately, this results in the two leads wanting to escape to alternative worlds where they think they truly belong. Doesn't this sound familiar? Maybe the premise of an isekai? Who knows? But it's clear the horror genre utilizing different world and parallel universe story templates is nothing new. While we relegate Junichi Ito as the pinnacle of horror manga, Fuyumi Ono was also a part of the genre's popularity. Some of her notable works include the mystery series Ghost Hunt and the vampire series Shiki, both of which were pretty successful and received anime adaptations. Other stories of hers that started getting critical attention were Strange Toke Tales, which was a runner-up to the 1993 Japan Fantasy Novel Award. Critics, editors, and fans proclaimed her as a master storyteller, combining themes of surrealism and coming of age. Even her spouse, Nakayuki Uchida, or his pen name, Yukito Ayatsuji, has created numerous works in the horror and mystery genre, so sci-fi and horror must run in the family. The Twelve Kingdoms as we know it today is Ono's magnum opus, despite not reading much fantasy prior to writing it. For Ono, it was simply a checkbox in the long list of titles because the editors asked her to write a fantasy series. When asked about her inspiration for creating fantasy stories, Ono viewed the Chronicles of Narnia and the Princess and Ambers as ideal series. She went on to lament that since her specialty is horror, the Twelve Kingdoms would heavily rely on historical drama and mystery rather than be purely fantastical, which could explain the heavy emphasis on Japanese history and other East Asian traditions embedded in the plot. This would become the impetus for her non-horror works, the staple of the genre. You know, no biggie. Yoko Nakajima is an unhappy high school student who is struggling to find her identity. She's a people pleaser and desires to make her family and friends proud of her, even at the expense of her own happiness. As an honor student and class president, Yoko succumbs to what her loved ones want her to be, propelling her quiet personality. She constantly is ridiculed by her classmates and parents to blend in with the crowd due to her red hair. After experiencing vivid reoccurring nightmares of supernatural creatures, those images steadily permeated her psyche at school. During the pilot, we are introduced to Keiki, a mysterious man who swears his allegiance to Yoko. Thereafter, they are pursued and attacked by Yoma, 
who are demon-like beasts that invade Yoko's school. Throughout the infighting, Keiki hands her Sugiyoto, a sword with a spirit lying dormant named Ayasuru, a creature that pressures Yoko into making rash decisions. Out of curiosity, two of her classmates, Asano and Yuka, enter the fray as they are transported to the Twelve Kingdoms. Unfortunately, this journey is not met without challenges. After passing through the Vortex of Light, Yoko ends up separated from her classmates and Keiki. She embarks on a quest to a village where she gets captured and locked up due to her foreign status. While in prison, she finds Asano and Yuka and is determined to learn how to survive in the various kingdoms with the end goal of returning home. The synopsis alone is standard isekai fare, with the first few episodes giving exposition for the circumstances the characters are in. With the ubiquity of battle action and political drama, this series should erupt with high ratings. Right. Being an avid anime fan, I can definitely say that this show has the worst character development I have seen in literally any other series or movies that I've watched. Even zero character development would be better than what most of the main characters are like. Not only is it painful to watch such 2D characters, but at least twice there are blocks of about five episodes or more in a row which are compiled of about 50% of one of the female characters crying over and over again literally at two minute intervals and feeling sorry for themselves. I couldn't make it through episode three. The main character is too annoying and whiny. I lost count of how many times she said, no, I can't do it. This series is totally unbearable. I'm on the seventh episode and still I'm clueless about what's the whole point. We get it, the main villain will be the main character herself, and someone will pull her out of the darkness, but to be honest, that could have been told in a language. Do you know how to spell disappointment? T-W-E-L-V-E-K-I-N-G-D-O-M-S. The anime started off pretty good, actually introducing the characters in the world to us, but alas, that lasted for three to four episodes. It goes downhill really quickly. I want... My tats. Nutrition is abysmal at this school. You know what this is? Toilet brush. Synopsis of series has always elicited unbridled opinions around fandoms. Whether that is people having ulcers over the Persona 5 anime, or people having ulcers over Skip and Loafer being a seinen, the start of a series is something that causes a lot of commotion. It's been widely documented that otaku fandoms are disdainful of some parts of an anime. It's inescapable. You cannot satisfy them all. Yoko can't be a 16 year old who's confused, frantic, and emotional over being transported to a new world. What even is distress? Is that made up? The plot is far too filler arky with incoherent pacing. People won't understand it. <laughs> Complex writing is a made-up technique, stop lying to yourself. But eventually, Yoko grew on people. While it took some patience for her attitude to adjust into someone more commanding, I was honestly really excited to see how her character would develop. A dark-skinned, red-haired queen? While these negative comments plague some responses to it, Overall, the American reception of it was good. Considering the 12 Kingdoms received a completed English dub, DVD, Blu-ray, two video games, and is fully licensed on Crunchyroll, Mubi, and Amazon Prime. When we first encounter Yoko, she lacks confidence and conviction due to her child rearing. Her parents groomed her to be a proper lady, to remain respectful, observant, and submissive. These are all common signifiers for trying to escape an unfulfilling environment that reinforces rigid gender norms. Yoko, interestingly enough, was inspired by letters Fuyumi Ono received from young readers about experiencing hardship and she basically confirmed she deliberately wrote Yoko this way. Many of my readers end up writing to me, and they often share their personal problems. I was never able to write back to them, so instead I wrote Sea of Shadow. As for the events that befall Yoko, I feel that all people end up experiencing to a greater or lesser extent the kind of mental and emotional trauma that Yoko does as they grow and establish themselves in the world. I've experienced the same things in the past, and I was able to overcome them somehow. Enriching readers' understanding of hardship is actually something Ono excels at. Even just in the Twelve Kingdoms, there are numerous instances of characters overcoming obstacles by acknowledging their weaknesses. Out of our first trio, Yoko is the only one who can interact with citizens of this world 
since they speak a different language. While this is overwhelming and places pressure on Yoko to be a leader, she embraces her role with pride even though it's a facade. Yuka believes she is destined to reside in the Twelve Kingdoms and will become a god, but she is shut down relentlessly by Keiki and manipulated by other government officials for their personal gain. Asano starts out clueless about this new world and its semantics, but gradually becomes more acclimated despite having the personality of a Dudmuffin. Experiencing the perils and new realities that impose guests as outsiders establishes why our main characters are so fearful of this new world. Their emotions are heightened due to the unfamiliarity of their surroundings, which explains why Yoko initially is very emotional. She is perceived as special, destined for the throne, but more than anything, she's different from your average isekai time traveler. With the exception of Yoko, our main characters are known as kaikyaku, who are sea guests who are caught from a shoku in Japan. Yoko, on the other hand, is revealed to be a taika, a human swept to Japan from the 12th kingdom before her birth and was later returned back. Aptly put, she was always a 12th kingdom's native. The kingdom's rulers, companions, and loyal servants are known as Girin, whose job is to provide wisdom and perform commands their ruler asks of them. The arrival of Gorin and the already established Keiki are emblematic of this label. Girin, in the mythological sense, refers to one of the rarest, most powerful creatures ever known in East Asia. It is a regal animal, holy and highly revered. Resembling a deer with scales like a dragon's covering its body, the Kirin is a chimerical beast. Its body and mane are covered in brilliant holy fire, and its face is the picture of utter serenity. They are also seen as symbols of justice and wisdom. Because of their holiness, images of Kirin frequently adorn temples and shrines. The appearance of a Kirin is believed to be a sign of the arrival of a great leader or a wise man. Ono captures the complexities of East Asian mythology and supernatural creatures in the Twelve Kingdoms. And I'm just discussing this on a broad picture scale. Her writing tends to add more context to each kingdom and the social structures put in place. And the constructions of her maps create this ambiguous East Asian setting. So that's the general vibe of the series. Dependent on how you consume the Twelve Kingdoms, your experience and enjoyment would vastly differ from others because the anime made some changes, or more accurately, subtractions. Shoujo anime adaptations are no stranger to receiving incomplete filler rendition of their original stories. The Twelve Kingdoms anime only covers events from the first four novels. Originally, the series was supposed to run for 68 episodes, but in 2004, John Cirabella, a Media Blasters representative, stated that due to the character designer having health problems, the anime was cut short to 45 episodes. Another possible reason is that the story was moving away from Yoko. While she's the main character in the anime, she's only one of few main characters in the novels. There's been speculation that the producer Producers felt they would lose their core audience if Yoko wasn't leading. Her source material was coming to a close, and Studio Paris likely caught up with the light novels and ran out of source material to adapt. We should also consider the demand in the anime industry during that time. The Twelve Kingdoms was directed by Sunio Kobayashi, whose filmography includes Super Gals, Glass Mask, Emma, and the seventh Naruto Shippuden movie The Last. I'm not sure if Naruto's popularity could have impacted the Twelve Kingdoms continuation since they weren't premiering simultaneously. So with this alleged information, the abrupt ending is somewhat understandable, and the argument that the anime is merely average is maybe a bit overblown. I'm just one person, but in my eyes, this series captivated a large subsection of people and followed its isekai predecessors faithfully. However, Twelve Kingdoms fans, specifically those who read the novels, had other thoughts. 
On one hand, it's fascinating to see that the majority of this interest from viewers came from Yoko's constant crying and turtle-like pacing. A male user provides an interesting perspective regarding this development in her character. The anime's biggest problem is how it adapted the first book. In the Sea of Shadow, Yuko stops crying early on as she realizes crying does nothing, and has to go through a harrowing two months on the brink of starving to death while being hunted by monsters every night. This difference is crucial, not the least because it makes Yuko more likable, but because it is the very nature of her physical journey that allows her to walk her own path of self-discovery. They went on to highlight sections in the novels where Yoko becomes hyper aware of the impact she has on others. She learns how to handle diplomatic situations and what it truly means to be a god. Another example is Taiki's storyline as a Black Gideon sadly did not receive a satisfying conclusion. 15 years before Yoko's arrival, Taiki is introduced by his Ranka being blown over to Horai by Ashoku. He returns to Mount Ho 10 years after his disappearance, where he was found by Enki. Enki looks after Taiki and is educated in his role as a Gideon of Tai. Hakusanshi, his Neokai, has been left in devastation due to Taiki's sudden absence and is overjoyed when he returns. The tide shift when Taiki is unable to transform into his Gideon form because of being in human form for an extended period. We learn that he attended Yoko's high school in Japan, and the anime finale leaves off with Enki searching for him. The novels continue Taiki's storyline in the shore of twilight, the sky at daybreak. In sum, Gyosu, the general of Tai, ascended to Ho, becoming its new ruler. To everyone's surprise, however, one of his military leaders, Asen, stages a coup d'etat when he becomes dissatisfied with Gyosu's reforms. This puts Taiki in danger when Asen targets him, resulting in him losing his horn. With Taiki's horn removed, he slowly loses memory of the Twelve Kingdoms and sparks other internal problems. Therefore, Sanshu and Goron become overprotective of Taiki, causing a ruckus among the people he holds dear. Although his arc doesn't wrap itself in a neat bow, it further explains why the anime's ending leaves some viewers unfulfilled. While the anime did not do the series full justice, the marketing in the West was just as complicated. In January 2007, Tokyo Pop started serializing the Twelve Kingdoms on their pop fiction banner, which became their first ever hardcover novel. It didn't take long, however, for Tokyo Pop to sever ties with the series at just four volumes, which was subsequently Consequently acquired by Shinkosha through their Shinko Bunko line in 2012, which branded the origin of their new series Shuragane no Kaki Genosuki in 2019, which was originally scheduled for release in 2016. And the rest is, well, history. Rumors of English licenses started flooding around internet corners in the late 2010s, pointing out obtainable ways to read the series. But it wasn't until Eugene Woodbury, English translator of The Twelve Kingdoms, that the novel started getting traction across social media. Reddit users often recommended Woodbury's translation of the series, as they have a great track record in authentically representing Japanese text. Eugene is still currently translating them, and while they're not Ono's exact words, who cares? At least we have something to fill our 12 kingdom size hole. What do people mean when they say the 12 kingdoms has the best character development of any anime? Perhaps it's the intriguing concept of how social hierarchy shapes a person's self-discovery. I'm guessing. In the series beginning, Yoko and Yuka started out as acquaintances at school due to their outcast circumstances, which quickly spun into a one-sided vitriolic battle. Yuka's enjoyment of fantasy novels prior to entering the Twelve Kingdoms makes her believe she is destined for greatness. As the first arcs due to Rakanis, Yuka becomes extremely jealous of Yoko when she finds out she is the chosen one. Cho, the king of Ko, takes advantage of Yuka's envy to convince her to fight against Yoko. He has ruled Ko for over 50 years and still feels that he cannot bring the kingdom to its former prosperity. Cho is ruthless, dictatorial, and wants to ensure that no one ascends the throne in K. When Yuka outlives her usefulness to him, she is discarded to the kingdom of N, where she meets a teacher and fellow Kaikyaku Heiki Rakujin. 
Even while he's attempting to help Yuka accept that she is not meant to be in the Twelve Kingdoms, she is enraged nonetheless that Yoko is the Queen of K. Throughout these segments, Yuka displays hostility towards Yoko as she thought she was too cowardly for a leadership position. From being overly trusty to strangers who ended up betraying them, to the long allotted time for her to acclimate, perpetuated Yuka's notion of being a superior kingdom ruler. This mentality, however, backfires when Hiki says that her misunderstanding of her own flaws is standing in the way of her reaching Yoko's success. During Yuka's last attempt to eliminate Yoko, she comes to realize her fate lies back in Japan. The two reconcile following Cho's Kirin's death, Gorin, and Yoko sends Yuka back to Japan, revealing the news to her mom about her whereabouts. Circling back to Cho, his demise was inevitable due to Korin suffering from Shitsudo, a sickness that Gideon acquires when a kingdom ruler fails to govern properly. And this becomes a pattern with antagonist characters. If you know, you know. From that moment onward, Yoko gradually changes into learning more about the kingdom she governs. Her companion and loyal friend Rakushun helps her understand the layout of the land. Formalities, unfortunately, get in the way of fully connecting with her people and lead to them not expressing their true feelings. This is exemplified when Rakushun distances himself from Yoko when he starts getting attached. As a Hanju, a beast that is human, he faces oppression in that he's prohibited from attending school, working, or owning property in some areas. It potentially could be embarrassing to have a friend who you constantly look after and would be perceived as a hindrance because of their social class. This separation made Yoko realize her purpose in this world, to break the system and reform her kingdom to a place of undeniable acceptance. To accomplish this feat, she needs to learn more about Kay, so she takes a leave of absence to educate herself. To some officials, this may appear to be a selfish venture. For Yoko, however, this was a necessary trip. Having a leadership position means nothing if you are not self-aware of your own shortcomings and making personal sacrifices. It's incredibly smart to craft Yoko as a character who's an individual, but doesn't let that part of her identity overtake her mission. She realizes the people she encounters have their own lives and motivations, and doesn't insert herself into their problems. Yoko's main objective is to find ways to be a better leader and create a cohesive empire, but she does not fully reprise his role until she gets a comprehensive understanding of the world around her. As the series progresses, we meet two other characters who become our infamous trio for the latter of the series, Suzu and Shokei. Suzu is introduced as a young girl living in Japan who is shy and introverted. Similarly to Yuka, Suzu is a kaikyaku who struggles with bullying and isolation at school. Her life takes a drastic turn when she is transported to the Twelve Kingdoms during the Meiji era. She later meets up with the Kingdom of Sai's Blue Miss Airy Mistress, Ryo. She takes Suzu in from the mountains and grants her the status of Seinin, so she may understand the language. Suzu served Ryo for a century, but is forced to endure a great deal of abuse. She attempts to torture Suzu with information about Yoko, sparking Suzu's desire to find her. She manages to escape by the skin of her teeth and briefly shelters with the Queen of Sai. As she sets off for Kei to search for Yoko, she befriends a boy named Seishu, who has failing eyesight. His father was killed by Yoma and his mother died from an illness, so he's been on his own for most of his life. For that reason, at first, they don't get along well, since despite Suzu having a difficult life, she's made no real effort to solve her predicaments. With admission, however, they slowly grow on each other as they voyage to Gyoten to meet Yoko. They get separated once reaching the Shisui Prefecture in Wa Province, leading to Seishu's horrific murder from being run over by a carriage enlisted by Shoko, our anime's main villain. In Seishu's final moments, he passes on his dying word to Yoshi, who is Yoko in disguise whispering, I don't want to die. You'll be fine. Because Suzu is going to cry again. When the news breaks to Suzu, she's in deep despair and becomes complacent in her misery. However, Yoshi comes in the 11th hour acting as a mentor figure, as they can relate to suffering from the rule of corrupt empires. Little does Yoshi know that Suzu resents her alias counterpart for not enforcing legislature to alleviate Shoko's inflating taxes. 
villagers in neighboring prefectures are exterminated if they can't pay the 70% tax, extending to the execution of their entire family. Let's return to that pattern where corrupt empires who concern themselves with individual power will always crumble. This is most visible with Shoke and Shoko, who are protagonists and antagonists respectively. Shoke, the Princess of Ho, lives a carefree, luxurious life until her parents were killed in a citizen uprising. Unbeknownst to Shoke, her parents were abusing their power. Because of their overwhelming body count, people took action to dispose of them permanently. Shoke is stripped of her luxuries and pushed out of Horai, but doesn't understand her punishment for her parents prioritizing self-indulgence in their reign. But that's exactly the problem. She's accepted the shiny, fabricated lifestyle she received at the expense of Ho, without ever questioning her father's leadership. Instead of groveling and relying on pity to escape her parents' atrocities, she presses this issue head-on, hoping to rewrite her kingdom's future. It didn't happen miraculously, of course, since she had to unlearn her perceptions of the lower class as humiliating and degrading, but she still made substantial progress. After a late-night conversation with Rakashun, she learns how civilization primarily is comprised of lower and middle-class people, and understand that she cannot wield power if she doesn't know her citizen struggles. Our trio of young women bands together and revolutionize against a common enemy. It's when all the forces of K take collective action to remove Shoko from power that they actually succeed. Even though Shoko shouldn't be forgiven, Yoko makes it clear that he shouldn't be killed off just yet, because that would defeat the purpose of receiving closure. Nearing the end of the anime, Yoko establishes new laws that prohibit bowing down to officials and wants each citizen to feel like they are each their own ruler. Her speech ignites changes in an oligarchic society that feels somewhat skeptical about deviating from tradition. It won't solve every problem, and it may be a terrible choice, but it's the choice Yoko feels will best create equality and unity that Kei desperately needs. The problem with previous leaders, specifically Shoko, is that they led a nation that was rooted in the marginalization and oppression of minorities. And this is more relevant than one might ponder. In our current times, discrimination under patriarchy creates systemic barriers for certain individuals who are unable to fulfill their aspirations, such as beauty is capital, individuals are the sole figurehead, and foreigners are the root of institutional issues. Your identity is worth more than the kingdom you govern or your social status. There is no straightforward path to becoming a moral person. But our mistakes can possibly empower us to rewrite our forefathers' deceptions. So what's the takeaway from this franchise's affair? Instead of leaving you with the Twelve Kingdoms being an unstoppable force and a refreshing taste of isekai goodness, I'm going to be fully transparent. Throughout this entire process of forming this video, I've always returned back to Ono's Anime News Network interview, where she talks about her experience of writing a novel. The hardest part, anyway. When you're trying to decide if the book will be amusing or if you're actually connecting with your readers, no matter how many times you reread it and analyze it, you'll never find the correct answer. That's because you can never really gain the proper perspective necessary to evaluate your own creation. Understanding the impossible standard, our judgment of a series will always be incomplete. It's the first half of a full picture. The layers in which Ono crafts the Twelve Kingdoms is so full and rich with themes that not even I can scratch the surface of the series' impact. It's the value of imperfection, weakness, and transformation that plagues the Twelve Kingdoms, which makes it so compelling. Recognizing your mistakes, even after its impact on others, is important. Acknowledging the subtle and not-so-subtle ways media impacts our reality is important. Human cruelty, ignorance, greed, and selfishness will always remain omnipresent, but that's how we live our lives. Individuals by nature are unique, but it's when we come together that we can fully understand our impact on society. Newsflash, 
Media's impact doesn't exist in a vacuum, and it's reflective of our current surroundings that, like it or not, is one of the first lessons in media literacy that we are taught growing up. Conceptually, we are the protagonists in our own lives, but we are far from the center focus. All roads don't lead back to us. They lead back to the socio-political climate indicative of our environment. While historical adventure isekai had a good run, sadly, its time is drawing to a close. As I mentioned earlier, it's been relegated to the realm of 90s and 2000s nostalgia, and for the majority of us, that's okay. With all the adoration of isekai discourse that's been glued to our phone screens, maybe, just maybe, shoujo isekai will always remain timeless.